Good afternoon and welcome to Matuska Taxidermy Studios Thursday Facebook Live uh, from the Iowa Great Lakes uh, where we are in the middle of another winter storm warning. Um, it's been a heck of a winter so far. We're hoping that we were over it, but it looks like we've got this one and another to look forward to. Um, I'm Brett and Tom will have to be joining us today by uh, remote, uh, some low tech uh, version, but he will be here with us occasionally. Yay. And uh, what, what Thursday Live would be, would be uh, like without Tom, we, we just don't know and we don't, we don't want to find out. So he's going to be with us uh, for the rest of the day. But um, last week we did a pedestal rod attachment and we barely got started on it. We just got um, our form started to alter. Uh, we had a few things that we were trying to get through and we had some good questions and we always encourage those, but uh, we're going to see if we can get you through that process today. And we just, we do so many different pedestals in the shop that um, the pedestal that we started last week is right here. And we, uh, we went ahead and put him together just because of deadlines. And we have another one that we're gonna pick up uh, right where we were. I think we kind of hinted toward that last week, so that shouldn't be too big a surprise. But anyway, um, Tom has decided to flee the winter and he and the family are enjoying Florida, hopefully enjoying Florida and uh, getting to see some of the the sunshine out there and we wish them all the best. We hope they're enjoying it and we do hope that they bring a little bit back in their pocket with them when they come home. Um, but we've got a lot to cover so I think we should probably get to it and I don't want to knock him around so I'm going to put Tom down for just a minute and uh, show you what we what we had last week. Last week we had talked about um, attaching pedestal mounts um, using square stock and uh, all different versions of that. We've got, we've got a bigger one here that we've used for a kudu. We've got one here that we'll use for our deer. We've even, we even showed some little ones that we like to use for things like birds and fish. But again, same, basically all the same concept, a square piece of rod um, of different sizes, whatever you can, whatever you can uh, hide in your animal, whatever you need structurally. Um, and then some sort of a sleeve. You don't necessarily have to have the sleeve pre-made. We, we talked about how to make that and we've done that with Bondo before, but we like to have a good tight fitting sleeve, which um, this one is a really good one. Works great for fish. We talked about that. I've seen some birds done with it. Um, it's pretty handy, but um, as you get started on your pedestal projects, one of the things that, as I made some notes today, that I thought I probably better reiterate is order your form and in very, I, I hope you can find one that fits. I hope you can find the pose that, that works perfect for you. But if you don't, um, if you have to do any alterations, um, get as close as you can. We like to order for size and uh, we'll alter for pose. But once you get it here, test fit your cape. Um, I can't tell you how important that is. It will make everything that you do going forward so much better if once you get your alterations done and your pedestal rod in place and all those things executed as well as you would like to have, it helps a lot if your cape fits and you can just proceed. Um, we've had some where we get a little bit ahead of ourselves and all of a sudden we got a really pretty looking mannequin, um, a great connection, and all of a sudden we get the cape out and wait a minute, this doesn't fit. Now we're back to sanding and doing all that stuff over. So um, if you're making a list, put test fit at the top of your list. Once you know that your cape fits, um, we want to alter for pose, um, which we've done with this guy here. Uh, we showed you a little bit on the other mannequin last week that we had put a couple extra cuts in it. Um, this was one of our competitor's choice deer. Uh, 
because we needed the size, this is a big deer. I think this is a 21 by 24. And um, we actually needed a little bit more uh, mass to the neck, but we, we got the biggest size that we had available. Um, and then we went to adding, Tom showed you how to add to the back portion. Um, we flipped him over and we added some foam on the back. We've also done several cuts and we've done some alteration uh, videos. So kind of refer you back to those as far as that goes. But um, now we've, we've got him back to the pose that we're looking for. We have uh, cut the foam to an approximate shape. I don't know if that's exactly where we're gonna end up, but we've just kind of got a rough little pedestal back to it. And um, I'm gonna turn that around and show you. I get a few things out of the way here. Um, we have sculpted the back to have a little bit of shape. And we talked about um, needing to put a board in the back. And that's really important because last week we cut the, pl the plywood off of the existing mannequin and we need something to attach him to our mounting stand. So I've left this one, get him out of the way here so I don't knock anything down. Um, I've left this one cut out. And all I did with this was take a piece of, we're gonna use a piece of three quarter inch plywood. And I put it up here. I traced around it and just dremeled out an opening in the back that's plenty deep. Um, one thing that's very important is that we make sure that it's deep enough to accommodate all of the edges so that as your back contours, you don't have plywood sticking out or funny little um, flat spots that, that uh, your edges come through and cause funny contours to your back. Now, the neat thing with pedestals is everybody finishes them differently. Um, lots of creative people out there. Tom talked about the little skunks in the back and there's anything from, from that to rocks to leather and uh, anything else in between. But for us, we're going to use a leather on the back and we'll just attach our mounting bracket directly to the back of the mannequin until we're ready, until we have all of the finish work done. And then we'll take the mounting bracket off and we will glue our leather to the back. And I think we've even showed you that on a previous, uh, on a previous live episode, I think we did uh, wall pedestals and we put suede leather on the back and, and we would do that the same way. So, um, but today I'm just gonna show you quick how we're gonna put that uh, plate in the back. And then um, I'm not going to, to go to the trouble of bondoing the whole back, but I would suggest that you do that before we, get, we do the mounting process. Um, but we will get, I'm going to show you that quick and let that set up. And then we're going to have a few different times where we've got, where foam will be rising or Bondo will be curing and we'll have to jump back and forth a little. But the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, is make sure that my shape is good, which I've, I've just done the rasp to get that uh, contoured correctly. And then to make sure you can see, I'm going to leave this somewhat high. In fact, I might turn it, Kate, so you can see a little better. Something like that. Now, if I were doing this uh, just in the studio, I probably wouldn't put this much contour to it. I would lay it perfectly flat, flat so the Bondo settles. But um, because I want you guys to be able to see it, we're going to leave it a little high. I think we'll end up with most of our Bondo cooling down in the bottom and I'll have to do another, a second pour up there, but um, I'll do that off camera later. But um, so for now, we talk about Bondo and I think, I think we've covered this several times, but any type of, of lightweight body filler will work. Um, Bondo is a brand. It's not a, it's not a product. Uh, a, a, it's not a general term, but we use it as a general term a lot. 
um, but just a lightweight body filler. And you can see this is pretty thick. It's kind of peanut butter thick, I suppose. Um, that's great for most applications, especially if you're gonna trowel it. But in this case, um, I want to pour it. So I'm gonna add polyester resin. This is your, this is the a glass portion of fiberglass. Um, I'm just gonna put a little bit in. See that? This is the same, it's a, a, like a laminating resin that we use for making fiberglass molds. Uh, you fish guys are probably real familiar with it from reinforcing your fish molds or boat builders or anybody like that. But I'm just gonna, yeah. Tyler Ono would like to know, do you ever use foam instead of Bondo? Uh, to attach the backboard, you certainly could. Um, and we'll show you in, in uh, the next steps as we install the pedestal rod. We'll show you, um, I'll use some 10 pound foam. Um, anytime you want something structural, I would go with the harder foam or, or Bondo or something like that. Um, the three pound mannequin foam is good. It's very strong um, and uninterrupted. In, like in your mannequin under pressure, it's a, it's a really strong foam. Um, once you cut it and free pour it, it doesn't quite have the strength. And because we're gonna basically suspend this deer off of this backboard during the whole mounting process, um, I want something a little bit stronger, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that. Um, also, anytime you use foam or Bondo or anything, you do wanna make some indentions and impressions in the back that your Bondo can grab hold of. And we'll either take a tack hammer or something, and I have some, some different dents and so forth in the back of this already, but I'm gonna put a few more in. This is just a little piece of rod. And all I'm trying to do is give that Bondo something to grab hold of so that it doesn't break free out of the foam. And that's why I'm actually putting them on an angle so they don't all have the same entrance point um, so they don't lift out easily. Um, you could do the same to the back of your board as well. Again, just a three quarter inch piece of plywood. Um, now I have thinned this uh, body filler with a little bit of polyester resin and a little goes a long ways. Don't, you don't have to do too much. And now I am going to grab some catalyst and I will pour that in and we'll let that set up. It won't take but just a minute. Um, you have lots of different catalyst options for Bondo, because we're going to cover this up completely. Um, I'm just going to grab what I grabbed was blue and that's standard comes with it. Um, a lot of times red comes with others, but I'm going to put in a generous amount because I want this to kick fairly quickly, but do be careful. They say one inch per golf ball size, uh, golf ball amount. Don't over catalyze your, your material or it will it will get brittle um, but we can't sit here all day so i'm going to catalyze that a little bit hot and actually it doesn't look too bad at all um, we also have white if any of you guys are building rocks or things like that that you don't want a blue tone or a red tone to show through um, white catalyst is fantastic because it'll give you a nice gray neut neutral gray color but um the negative is it doesn't discolor the gray and it's very hard to tell when you've got it completely mixed the nice thing about the blue is that i can see i don't have any marbling uh, my color is consistent and i know that this is thoroughly catalyzed so that being said i am just going to pour some in here. Um, no real rhyme or reason to this. Make sure 
that your plate does not interfere with your pedestal attachment, our rod is going to be a little further ahead um, in, the, in the brisket on this deer than the, than the plate. So I know we're clear of that. Um, and I'm just got that poured in there. I'm gonna insert the board and press it in, wiggle it around, make sure that I've got Bondo pressed into all of those little pores and cavities. And, and that should do it um, for the back. It can kind of do its own thing now and set up. I'm gonna level it out just a little bit and let it, uh, let some of that Bondo settle down. And then again, once we get this board in place, we can always come back and fill. Um, we can either foam over it or we can bondo over it. Um, either one of those would work now that we have a good bond, now that we have it attached good. There we go. And that's the same thing that we did with the deer last week. Um, we put a board in the back so that he could be mounted. Um, I'll switch over Kate and show them um, what the back looks like on this deer. This guy we have all blue. Um, because I bondoed and smoothed the back, sanded it, got it ready for leather before I mounted him. Um, but I still have the mounting bracket on the deer and, and we left that. I just put him on the habitat base to show you this afternoon, but I'll take him back off of the base and put him on the mounting stand uh, to, to continue drying this week. But, um, so I just left him on there, but that's what we have so far. And it is show season. And I've talked to several people already that are getting their show pieces together. And uh, so you guys that are getting ready to do your pedestals, hopefully there's, there's something in here that, that's helpful to you. Ooh, I had another Craig question. Metz says, hey Brett, would hey. you guys consider a video on removable antlers on big, big elk or moose? Had several requests in the shop. Kind of same process. Uh, Craig. No, because that's hard. <laughs> and you would know, uh, we did lots of those with Cabela's and, and Craig was, I worked with Craig at Cabela's too. So um, no, that's something we sh certainly could, um, but a very difficult process to do in, in this type of a setting, we may be able to do easier a whitetail and kind of show you. And yes, very similar um, rods and attachments and so forth, square pegs. Um, but uh, might be easier to do with a deer than an elk because all we're going to do is upsize when we get to an elk. That's a, that's a tremendously difficult one and half the time on an elk, honestly, we end up getting one in place, put the second one on, and then we may pull it out and re-drill it several different times to make sure that we got our measurements um, just because there's some critical times there. So. We'll put it on our list. I hope everything is going well for you, Craig, and we'll see if we can get that um, on there. But it might be in the form of a deer than an elk. Um, Heather yeah. says, thanks for the great info and support you guys <laughs> offer. No problem. No problem at all. We enjoy doing it. We really do. It takes a little bit of thought to figure out something that we haven't done in the last year or two, but um, so as you guys get ideas, just like Craig just did, um, please send us suggestions. Um, we are always looking for new ideas. Um, but I'm just gonna babysit this for a minute. It, because I added the polyester resin, uh, this is gonna be just a little bit slower, um, but I'm, just keep your, keep your cup 
next to you so you can monitor that. Um, you know, when we talked about uh, attachments last week, we talked about um, delicate attachments. We talked about uh, two rods versus one, um, two square, versus, or uh, I should say two round connect points of connection versus one square one. Um, the nice part about square is that it doesn't turn on you. Um, something that we didn't go into very far that is worth mentioning is stability. And sometimes you see some of these amazing artistic creations that guys have a really calculated balance point. Um, mountain lions jumping on the back of sheep that are attached to, to maybe only one foot running off of a mountain. Um, amazing, amazing attachments. Um, definitely consider the stability of the attachment and the balance point. Um, that's something that you, you want to really consider and you'll see with this one. Um, we're going to stay down in the brisket. We did talk about simple attachments versus more complicated and this one um, because he goes on, I think, like a whiskey barrel. Um, we're going to keep it basic, pretty simple right in the middle. But do think about that um, and, and the balance point. Yes, we do have a couple comments coming in. Sure. Brandon says, enjoy the tips and tricks. Janet Kurth would like to know what form is that big buck? It is gorgeous. The big buck, this guy here. Um, that was a CC, one of our competitors' choice that we took and just did some alterations to. All, actually, all of these are a version of something that we have here in the catalog, but they all have cuts and turns. And we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have pedestals in the, in the catalog. We have some wall pedestals that, uh, we have some new mule deer wall pedestals that will be coming in the future. Um, we have whitetail wall pedestals in the competitor's choice version and hopefully someday soon some XPs. But um, sometimes it works really good to start with those. They'll give you a good point. Or if you don't have, if you have a favorite mannequin that you use every day for your shoulder mounts, don't be afraid to cut the back and add the pedestal portion, put, put a board in the back and, and we'll continue to walk you through that process. But um, that's what what we like to do. We like to go with something we're familiar with, something that fits, and then we'll alter poses to, to get some flow to it. Fred Burtz says he would like to see a snake or turtle. Fred Burtz, goodness gracious. We have big elk and turtles and snakes. Oh my gosh. Um, I think Tom would think that's fantastic and would be happy to do those for you. I might schedule a, I, I might schedule my Florida vacation for, for turtle time, but uh, no, uh, those would be good ones. Those are good ones and we haven't touched on those before. Um, and that might be something we can add to the, add to the mix. Um, now, this is kind of a critical time for you guys that I'm sure 95% of you have used Bondo or Auto Body Putty at some point, but this is a pretty critical time um, in the curing process for it. It is, you can still, you can see it's still shiny. Um, it is still flexible, but very, um, it's kind of gelatiny. It doesn't run anymore. Um, really important that you don't interrupt the curing process at this point because it will, um, you'll lose all of the integrity of the Bondo. So, um, if you're attaching something, now is the time you do not want to move. You can move while it's, it is uh, loose and pourable. Um, that's fine. But once it gets to this stage, you want to make sure that you are rock steady, um, solid, so that it can, it can cure exactly like it is. Um, and the same with the back. I don't want to, I don't, I'm close to time where I can, lift this up, but I don't want to disturb the backboard now because um, we want a really nice solid connection. Um, another thing that, um, that kind of goes along the lines of the alterations, and we may have touched on this before, it's something that we do with all of our, all of our mannequins. Um, when we put a cut in them, somebody had asked earlier about the strength of foam 
and foam is very strong, but once you interrupt it, it can be a little bit, um, it can cause some weak points. And um, we like to put a threaded rod, um, a piece of all thread. You can use a two by two or a one by two, some sort of a board if you want to. But um, we like to put a threaded rod in our mannequins. I am not going to do that today because um, I want to be able to maybe change this a little bit since the boss man isn't here to approve our final pose. Um, we, uh, I'm going to leave that open, but I did want to, I did want to show you this and something that's kind of fun about this one. Um, I can't even tell you whose idea this was, but it works great in the shop. Um, we take threaded rod and we'll put on the grinder. Um, we'll give it a point like so. So we'll grind the point and then let's see if I can get right back to where we were on the other end of it. We will cut a slot and the slot we usually cut with a, a reciprocating saw as straight as we can. And then we use a slotted screwdriver and um, it's, you got to be very careful with that. But uh, that could be kind of scary, but we do that and it works pretty good. So it, you can just screw it in from the back and it works real good. So now that we have our Bondo is set up pretty good on the back, I can lift him up here and show you. If I wanted to, I should probably let it cure a little bit longer. But now I could take the mounting stand bracket and I could screw it to the back right there. And it would be real easy to work with. I have. Uh, I have just skewers in this one and we'll proceed with those today just because um, I don't want that to come off. I need probably to let that cure another 20 or 30 minutes. Um, but that's what we would do. The next step, if we weren't on live, I think the next step I would, I would do in finishing this back is to possibly foam around this gap a little bit or just pour straight Bondo in there and then um, I would bondo the whole thing, just like you were fixing the side of a car. Um, we'll put a thin layer of bondo over the whole thing, rasp it, smooth it with sandpaper, um, get it nice and pretty smooth because we like to use a high quality leather on the back side of our game heads. Um, and that just gives us a really nice surface um, for it to adhere to. So, as I talk about that, I see that um, my skewers may, I might hit my attachment point. So I think I'm gonna pull this off of the skewers, maybe, and move it just a little ways. Gonna do it like this. And this is just a neat little accessory that you can get for Bob Fothery's mounting stands. It's just a, it's just a mounting bracket that has. I think it actually had three um, heavy-duty wires that are in the back. I'll turn it so you can see it. Um, three heavy-duty wires. Uh, we have one of them taken out, so we just have two. Um, but I'm going to move that up forward into the neck so that I don't run the risk of, of uh, hitting it when I, put the, when I put the rod in. So I'll move that. Ooh, I bet that sound is great on camera. Nails Cover your on ears a one more time. There. Okay. All right, so now I know I can do that. Gosh, I can feel the heat from the Bondo in the back. I think Tom's happy about that. And he's glad I didn't hit the rod on the camera. Okay, so now um, the next thing we have to do is put the attachment in 
And to do that, we're, we're going to use, we're going to use this um, kind of a <laughs> blank armature with a post. And Tom just, I think we talked about him last week, Tom took it up to the welder. It's just a real simple T post. Um, and then we have a, we have another sleeve, which you could use the sleeve hole, or in this case, we only used about six inches of sleeve and then welded another piece of the post to the top so that this fits over like that. Um, this piece will go up inside of our mannequin and it will leave us a little bit of space for uh, down here on the bottom, some space for habitat. So now we have to decide where we're going to put that in the mannequin. And for this one, I think we, we talked about uh, staying pretty much in the middle, um, somewhere easy to balance, easy to conceal, um, and will work real good on that um, on that round shape, that round symmetrical shape um, that we're going to have to work with. So um, the most important thing is that we have our mannequin level. And as you can see right now, he is not. So I am going to level the mannequin. looking at there we go and not only do we want to level his eyes but we also want to level him in relationship to his body and shoulders so I'm gonna step over on that side of him and make sure that his shoulders are square um, looks like I might have him rotated a little bit Back. And one thing that's really important, after you get him nice and square and level, it's nice to put an, a level line on your deer. So we do that anytime, once we've done our alterations um, and attached the head permanently, um, we will put a level line on. And I was looking for my marker. Well, I already have it on there, so imagine that I have a marker. We'll just put a level on the side, and we will mark that line, which this tells me I need to bring his nose down just a little bit. And it's really nice to have those index marks to refer back to so that you know exactly where you were when you were in the sculpting process. Um, if you look at a lot of mannequins, um, there we go, um, you'll see sculptors have little index marks here and there on their, on their sculptures, and that's usually for them to get their clay level and get everything working right. So um, now that we have that level and square, I like the chest, that looks good. Um, now we need to drill a hole. And drilling a hole to accommodate this piece can be a little bit um, daunting because the hole, not only does the mannequin need to be level, but the hole needs to be square enough that this can sit level. It doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to drill an oversized hole, but in order to, to make sure that we can put that the mannequin comes back nice and level we need to make sure that uh, we can we drill a hole straight enough that we can have this underneath set up so that it is square and to do that it can be a little bit intimidating so we're going to take a long drill bit like this this is actually it's a standard this is an inch and an eighth we have um, incidentally we have about uh, I'm gonna guess three eighths maybe half inch rod um, our square 
material and we're going to drill the hole with an in inch and an eighth. You could go inch and a quarter, you could go a one inch, but I'd probably like to stay to this bigger size because that gives us some wiggle room inside. Um, the next, next part that's very handy is to have extensions. Um, I have two extensions here, I guess one's about a six inch extension and one is probably a foot. Um, and they have a locking mechanism. Make sure that you get the extensions with the lock. The magnetic ones um, can fail. I know of at least a couple pedestals that have claimed that will not pass a metal detector because they have drill bits somewhere lost inside of them. So locking mechanism, um, and we're just gonna drill a hole. Now, how do we drill a straight hole up and down? up through this mannequin. Um, this is one of Tom's many fancy inventions. Yay. Um, this little guy here, I don't think we covered it last week, um, but it is just a, a board, a two by four on a probably 12 inch by 12 inch platform and a half piece of PVC pipe and then a line in it so that this was drilled in straight up and down. We can count on that center line being, if the base is, is level, that center line will be perfectly square. And then what we can do from that, you might zoom out just a little, Kate. Um, that piece of PVC pipe will accept the backside of your drill and give you a nice channel guide to drill that hole up through the underside of your, of your mannequin. Tom's falling down, shh, don't fall down. There we go. Um, so we're gonna do that. Now, the hard part is I have to get far enough below the mannequin to accommodate all of the drill bit here and that's gonna be a little challenging because I lowered the mannequin when I put it back in. So the first thing I'm gonna do is turn him and raise him as high as I can get him. Like that. And then I'm going to Slide this under, hoping that I have enough room under my bucket. Maybe. Maybe not. Looks like I need a couple more inches. Okay, that's fine. I'm just gonna have to do it from the floor. Okay. I'm gonna get this out of here, this over here. I'm going to shoot just a little bit further forward. That looks about right. So with that in place, I'm going to go ahead and drill and see if we can get this where it needs to be. Tom's gonna watch <laughs> and see. Right about there.
there we have our hole that's come all the way up through the back. And I think it should be nice and square. Tom was a little nervous, but I think we're okay. All right, now that we have a hole, some of you are gonna ask, why did you drill it all the way through the back? The reason we drilled it all the way through the back is because now we can come over here, bring our pedestal base, in with the rod attached and I can slide it under and before I do that I'm gonna talk to you just a little bit about this I'm getting ahead of myself um, anytime you do anything with um, adhesion anything that requires adhesion make sure that especially with metal that you wipe it down really good with a solvent I have done that. Um, I wiped it down with lacquer thinner. And then I also took and I put this on the grinder and I even used the reciprocating saw like this. This would be another one for scary Tom face. But that's just done to promote adhesion. So we had a rod that looked like this and I've roughed it up. Now this rod that we have here that's on our pedestal base, we want this to be nice and smooth. In fact, so smooth that Tom has gone through and even before he left, he touched that up with um, uh, an emery cloth or some, some uh, steel wool just to take the burrs off so that now that we have, we have a really nice, um, we have a really nice connection. So that will slide up and down really good. Um, also to be safe, if you want to, you can take the rod down below that you don't want any of your, your material to stick to and you can put some wax on it. And I'm gonna do that just because I wanna reassure that we don't have any issues with, with that rod sticking together. So I'm just quick going to come in here. Um, a good idea would be to wax and buff that. Um, I'm just going to rub some part of wax on it. I think it should be pretty good. Um, I've already buffed this once before, but I'm going to put, up, put some on just in case. Okay, so I've got some wax on there. Any of you that have waxed and buffed things know that this process, you really want to buff that. You want to let it dry and buff it, and it'll get a nice shine, but that's just kind of an assurance. Now, this one does have a better side. There we go. It goes down a little cleaner. I'm in one direction. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring that base over and I'm going to verify that our deer is still level. Looks pretty good. Pretty good there. And then I'm going to take this base with the with the rod on it and slide that whole thing up inside and I am getting ahead of myself because I need to blow that out lots of debris inside there and um, I want to make sure I get all that out cover your eyes Holly says, big hugs, Tom. You got this, Brent. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Funny, funny. Thanks for the encouragement. We, uh, this could be make it or break it. 
this doesn't go well, Brett might not have a job when Tom comes <laughs> back. All right. So I want that about right there. And I think I may just go ahead and put a screw in that just to make sure that that doesn't move while we're doing this. Such a big job. I hope you guys are charging for your pedestals. One of the things Tom said before he left was, we really should keep track of the time that goes into these because I'm not sure that we charge enough for this. And as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, yeah, I think you're right. Okay. So I've got that attached. It's not going anywhere. Um, I do want to make sure that that base is relatively level. Where? might need to come up. I've just got some shims here. I'm going to bring this up on one side. There we go. There we go. That's what we want. Make sure our deer is still square. And setting up a pedestal, all of this part is what makes, determines success. How well you do in the planning stages and putting it all together. Now, Kate, can you show them? I am just lowering this down to just cover the end of that sleeve so if you were if you could see inside and we'll use this as an example I've just taken the mannequin down far enough to cover this section the sleeve the rest of this I'm going to leave exposed because we're going to cover that with habitat so all of this will get covered with habitat that portion down there. So I think that's going to be pretty good. It lines up nice. As I look down here, yeah, my rod looks like the rod's just kind of touching the side of the hole up there, but I think that's all good. Now, um, I'm drilled all the way through with an inch and an eighth, and I'm only putting, oh, half inch back through it. So I need something to plug that hole and I'm just going to use oil-based clay and I've microwaved this so it's fairly soft. It's gotten kind of firmed up in the last little while, but I am just going to plug that hole with this oil clay and really, really pinch it down around that rod. Make sure that the hole is covered, that the rod is covered. Um, that's going to keep anything from sticking to it. I'm going to pour a really liquidy 10 pound foam mixture down in there and it will probably leak just a little. The last one leaked a little, not very much, but a little. And I'm going to cover that a little bit just in case. I think that should be okay. That will keep the foam off of the majority of the rod and hopefully up inside the mannequin. Ooh. Okay. And happy Tom again. I remembered to plug the hole. Um, now, um, we have two different kinds of foam. And we touched on this last week, if you remember, I poured some of the 10 pound foam onto a plate 
And then we never came back to it. And I was super sad because that was kind of a cool demo. And we may do that for you at another time. Um, but this 10 pound foam, this is the same plate. And you can see it is as hard as, oh man, any, it's as hard as Bondo for sure. But the nice thing is, is it has a little bit of expansion. So when you order from us or anyone, um, if you order 10 pound structural foam, understand that this foam does not rise near as much as the three pound foam. But it, it functions much in the same way. So um, equal parts of A and B, you can weigh it if you want. I'm gonna do it by volume because it's a pretty small amount. And in this case, I really don't need to fill the whole back, the whole, the entire hole that I cut. Um, I don't have to fill that. I just want to basically tack this in place. I think the last one we did, it actually rose um, more than I thought it would, but um, I'm gonna fill it hopefully within three inches of the top. And then the last little bit, I will do a three pound foam so that it's easy for me to carve and sand. And since it came out in the wrinkles, I can sand those wrinkles in the back if we decide to use them. Um, but I don't want it to fill completely. So equal parts of A and B, um, you can see here, I've got about a half an inch. Um, and I'm just gonna take that, pour the two parts together, mix it up. And again, really all this batch is gonna do is seal up the hole on the bottom and maybe create a little bit of expansion and start to rise up the tube. But I am going to pour intentionally from the top because you won't be able to see it. Um, I'm gonna pour straight down and I'm gonna try and really pour it on top of that rod so that I, I get a good coverage to the rod. And then whatever runs down into the bottom We'll gather and then we'll we will fill from the top later. Um, so mix it thoroughly. You don't have to beat it to death, but um, mix mix your foam together. Um, sometimes it's beneficial to pour foam um, as it's thicker, like we did on the back. But in this case, I really want to pour this foam thin um, before it gets much rise so that I can make sure that I'm getting it all the way down to the bottom and all the way around that rod. All right, so there we go. Um, I, I don't wanna move him or I, we would show you on the camera a little bit closer, but at this point, um, I like to always keep the cup close so I can monitor, just like we did with the Bondo, I can kind of monitor what the foam is acting like. And uh, we'll see what we come up with. Um, ooh, I don't see any leaks. That's good, I think, I hope. Um, but that's really important. So we've got that piece in place. Um, now, I didn't mention the fact that we bolted the T plate down to our habitat base. And we have that in these other ones and you can see how we went about that. Um, some of them are through bolts. In this case, um, the smaller rod, we've just got um, heavy duty um, star headed screws, decking screws that we've screwed this down to a temporary base. Um, and that should, that should accommodate us pretty good. You wanna make sure that this is locked in so that you can level it and anchor it. Um, to get that done. But now it's just kind of a matter of, of waiting. Um, you can see it is starting to foam a little bit. I should look and see if it's coming up. Uh, it's moving, not much, but it is coming up. Um, and so once that's set up, I can do another batch and, and then we will uh, pull the two parts apart. Um, Yes. Mike would like to know which foam would be best to making for making duck heads. 
That is a good question. And typically, although um, a lot of commercial duck heads are made with a, with a resin, um, it's more of a non-expanding resin. They're hard. But the negative to that is it's really hard to poke a pin into it. So um, there, there's kind of a, a back and forth. The, the hard part about foams that expand um, as far as making parts is they're prone to air bubbles. So you can end up with little micro bubbles which um, show up in the bill, as particularly when you do uh, any sort of washes or when you, um, when you paint. And then I think Tom showed you a few weeks ago how we would uh, paint a little bit of dark color and then steel wool it off to antique it. Um, micro bubbles show really bad when you do any antiquing. So um, my choice would not be foam. Um, choice would be something more dense and like a polycast resin works really well, similar to fantastic cast or things like that. Um, super casting plastic, any of those uh, resins will work really good for you. Um, if you wanted something that you could poke a pin into, you may have to make two pours out of it where you pour the back half and, and the bill separately. But um, that's kind of how we would go about that. Sorry, that's a little bit of a wishy-washy um, answer to it, but um, I think that will give you the best, the best results. Um, yeah. Oh, we're doing good. Um, so just to give you an update on the rising foam, I'm probably three inches from the top of the back, which is about where I was hoping we would be with that. And then I would pour um, three pound foam on top of it. Um, I'm not gonna have time today, but Kate, if you can remind us, maybe we can do just a little clip next week where we'll pour, maybe Tom and I can both, because he'll be back, we hope. We hope he comes back. Um, we'll pour some uh, 10 pound foam and the same quantity in another plate. We'll pour three pound foam and you'll be able to see the difference in expansion. It, it will be a vast, vast difference. Um, but we'll do that for you so that you can see. But, but anybody that's wondering 10 pound versus three pound, if you don't need much expansion and you do need strength, 10 pound is a great choice. Um, if you want expansion, if you want to be able to sand it and shape it um, like we do with our alterations, um, definitely go with three pound. Don't pour 10 pound and then come back the next day and expect to be able to sand it because it's going to be more like carving pine than it is uh, carving foam. So I think that will kind of do it um, for today. I've I want to leave this connection and would encourage you guys to be very patient with your connections. Um, give them a minimum of an hour probably to cure. And with foam or Bondo or anything like that, um, you'll feel the heat as, as it creates its reaction. Um, don't touch it until it is completely cooled. And I would even wait beyond that time too, just because uh, Bondo, foam, things like that tend to shrink a little bit and they, they stay brittle until they completely cure. So um, give it time. Patience pays in this case and we'll take that off for you tomorrow. But right now I don't want to interrupt that. Um, I think we have a giveaway. We do. We do. And last week we talked about the big pedestal rod. I think we gave one lucky person one of these. And this week, we're going to do the small pedestal rod because this is my favorite and nobody was here to tell me different. So that's mm -hmm. the one we're going to do. Um, and who is our winner? Our winner goes to John Beater. And I apologize if I butchered that. <laughs> John, this one's for you. This is this will come with your next order. This is a great attachment, much stronger than um, its size indicates and and uh, Hopefully you can do something cool with it, but it comes with both the brass sleeve and the, uh, and the stainless steel rod. It's about a one foot length and you'll get it with your next order. 
And then I do have a really quick question Ooh, that came through perfect. from Jason Nestor. He says, off topic, Brett, but I use Createx water-based paints. Can I use Rust Oleum High Gloss Clear Coat over that? Rust Oleum High Gloss Clear Coat, I believe you can as long as it's not an enamel. Um, I've had really good luck. I think Tom has two with Createx and being durable and compatible with a lot of different things. However, um, I did have one experience where I had painted it on a metal surface and um, I had painted the, a metal primer on it, painted some kind of fun Createx on there, let it sit for a day, came back with an enamel gloss because I thought I wanted a stronger gloss and it ate through my paint. So don't do that. Um, but anything else has worked real good. We use we like to use Krylon um, clear gloss. We use that a lot. We use workable fixative. We use the Createx glosses. We use um, the automotive, the 2K spray, spray max gloss, and even the automotive gloss out of the gun. All of those work great with Createx. My only bad experience has had enamel on the can. So make sure it's not enamel and I think it'll do you good. Awesome, make sure to like and share this video to be entered in next week's giveaway. And Tom will be back next week. Yes. All the faces of Tom will be back. 